Uh, a study uh, done in 2017 by the company Deloitte found this out. 91% uh, of consumers do not read the terms and conditions in an agreement before signing. And I read that and I was like, that seems low if uh, my habits are any indication. 91% people do not read, they just click agree. And sometimes that leads to some interesting scenarios. So I wanted to share a few with you. Uh, uh, in this 2016, a woman named Danielle Chit Chittadino, she bought a dog from a pet store. And uh, two years after she bought this dog, she got a bill in the mail. And uh, she called the pet store only to find out that for all of this time, she had not in fact owned the dog. She had only been leasing it according to the agreement that she signed. So that's fun. Uh, MailChimp's user agreement says that they won't be held liable for any performance issues arising from cir circumstances outside of their control. Fair enough. But such circumstances in their agreement include fire, earthquake, nuclear accident, and zombie apocalypse. In 2017, uh, 22,000 people signed up for a pre, uh, free public Wi-Fi through a UK-based company uh, called Purple, it's a technology company. But in signing the agreement, they inadvertently agreed to do a thousand hours of community service, including cleaning toilets and, quote, relieving sewer blockages. <laughs> and maybe my favorite, a British company called GameStation had a clause in its license agreement that gave GameStation a, quote, non-transferable option to claim for now and forevermore the immortal soul of any user, end quote. <laughs> GameStation said that if they chose to exercise the sole transfer, they would notify its user using six-foot-high letters of fire. <laughs> Terms and conditions. Uh, welcome to our final installment in a teaching series that we are calling Help My Unbelief. And we've been looking at the Gospels and specifically how Jesus interacts with people who are wrestling with doubts and questions. And we hope uh, that this has been communicated to you so far, that this is a safe place for you to bring all of your doubts, all of your wrestling, all of your questions that you have about belief. Jesus is a safe place to bring those things. But as we wrap up our series today, we're going to look at a passage out of the Gospel of Mark. You can turn there if you'd like now, uh, where Jesus is the one who is asking the question. And the question that he asks launches him and the disciples into this discussion about what it means to follow him. And at the end of this passage today, uh, we are going to see this phrase come out of Jesus' mouth. He's going to say, whoever wants to be my disciple must. And he goes on to describe what you might call the terms and conditions of discipleship. Now, if a non-Christian came up to you this week and they said, hey, uh, tell me what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what does that entail, what would you say? My concern is that many of us would say something like, well, you, all you have to do is believe in Jesus, and then you simply wait until you die, and when you do, you get whatever you want and you get to live forever. Uh, and that's how that goes. Uh, and, and that's just not the kind of picture of discipleship that Jesus paints. He doesn't come in with this slick sales pitch. He doesn't paint a rosy picture and hide the cost on the last page. Jesus leads with the fine print, you might say. And that fine print is what we're going to look at today in Mark's gospel. So Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So just to break these three responses down, uh, John the Baptist, if you are here last week, Pastor Ian talked about John, uh, cousin to Jesus. He was a prophet, forerunner of Jesus, and he was put in prison for criticizing the uh, marriage of Herod Antipas. So uh, Herod put him in, in prison. It eventually led to his beheading. Okay, but he was such a prominent figure, uh, and Jesus was gaining such a following that Herod believed that Jesus was John the Baptist reincarnated. That's how powerful he thought John was. Uh, Elijah. Some people thought Jesus was Elijah. Now, what you needed about Elijah is he was an Old Testament prophet, very kind of renowned, but he was made uh, famous more so by his death than his teaching, or rather his absence of death. Uh, Second Kings teaches us that Elijah was caught up bodily into heaven without dying. How would you like to have that on your resume? That's a pretty amazing thing, right? And it was believed that Elijah would come back before the great and terrible day of the Lord to preach God's word, and there was speculation at this time that Jesus was Elijah. 
Third, people are saying that Jesus is one of the prophets. Uh, so Moses, before he died, said there will be a day where God will raise up a prophet even greater than me. And so for thousands of years, God's people had had their eye out for this definitive prophet who would come in once and for all, definitively declare God's word to his people. And so uh, these are the kind of responses out in the water. What do people think about Jesus? Elijah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. What do they have in common? Essentially, they all boil down to this. Uh, people say, uh, Jesus, you're great, but you're not God. These three particular beliefs about Jesus, they're all incredible. They, they held Jesus in high esteem. They said, Jesus, you are a great and respectable religious figure. But what this allowed people to do is admire Jesus while keeping him at arm's length. Now, this is sort of a uh, common posture in our time, right? Jesus is a great moral teacher. You might hear that thrown around. But if you dig into that statement, really what people are saying is that he's nothing more than humanity at its best. The crowds are saying, Jesus, you're great, but you're not God. So how does Jesus respond? As we'll see in a moment, Jesus actually does not give this response to the time of day. And here's why. Because Jesus is not after fans, he's after hearts. Jesus couldn't care less about accolades and applause. He wants your heart. When I was in high school, uh, my best friend for several years uh, was a girl. And uh, she and I uh, were very, very close, and we spent a ton of time together, had a ton in common, but we were always just friends. Until one day somebody came up to me and they said, hey, what are you guys just going to start dating? And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, you seem perfect for each other. And I said, well, I never thought of that. And that thought never left my mind after that. And so I sat down, mustered up the courage uh, to have this sit-down conversation with her. And I just poured out my heart. I told her how I feel about her. I said, I hear all the things I just love about you. In fact, I am in love with you. And she leaned over, she grabbed my hand. She looked me in the eyes and she said, I think you're pretty great. And I've been put in what I would later come to find out is called the friend zone. So this is a thing. This is apparently the international side Googled this. What a, what a fantastic image. Somebody's like, complete my heart. And they're like, yeah, you're great, okay? Uh, this is where, I, this, this sounds like, friend zone sounds like a nice place to be. Friend zone is not a nice place to be, okay, if you've ever been there. Uh, maybe the worst thing that you can hear after you tell somebody, I'm in love with you, is the response, I think you're pretty great. A survey done last, uh, last year by a group called State of Theology found this, that 52% of American adults, regardless of kind of religious tradition, believe that Jesus was a great teacher and nothing more. 52% of Americans. That's maybe not surprising. Here's what is surprising. 43% of evangelicals in America also agree with that statement that Jesus is just a great teacher, nothing more. For many of us, Jesus is after our hearts. And what we've done is we've just given him the finger. We've said, awesome, Jesus. You're great. It's a way of keeping Jesus sort of on a pedestal, a celebrity Jesus, but it's our way of keeping him at arm's length so he really has no say over what we do with our lives. Now, the problem is Jesus is not content to be put in the friend zone. C.S. Lewis famously put it this way. He said, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. The crowds have spoken. And this is their verdict. Jesus, you are great, but you're not God. And Jesus just keeps the conversation moving. He turns to his disciples and he asks another question. Verse 29. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? In, when I was a senior in high school, 17 years old, I went on a fishing trip with several other guys and a high school youth pastor. I was an atheist at the time. I'd spent several years in high school as an atheist. Uh, and if you know some of my story, uh, there was like a lot of my life that began to kind of break down and crumble in uh, late high school. And I found myself in this group of guys who were followers of Jesus. And I did not believe what they believed, but I was compelled by their true, sincere devotion to Jesus 
uh, their love and care for one another and the sense of deep purpose that they had for their life. And so I just kind of kept hanging around them. And so uh, Jared, the high school youth pastor, invited me and these guys to go out to Green Lake, Oregon, where we spent four days on an island with no cell phone signal, no electricity. We like brought a sleeping bag and food and that was it. And we just hung out. And uh, just some really formative conversations in, in the, around the campfire. It was where I learned my first few chords on the guitar. Uh, I look back on that trip with a lot of fondness, but one thing about that trip stuck out to me more than anything. And that was a conversation that I had on the very last day. I was standing on the banks of this island with a rod and reel in my hand, just waiting for fish. And Jared makes his way, I stand there alone, Jared makes his way over to me. And uh, he said, hey, we've been, uh, you've been kind of hanging around a lot lately. But I have a question for you. Where do you stand with Jesus? And it sort of caught me off guard. I, I said, I really don't know. I haven't really made up my mind yet. And he said, that's fine, but I want you to know that you can't stay in that place forever. We all have to make our minds up about who Jesus says he is and how we respond. Notice Jesus first asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And then he narrows the focus. He says, how about you? Who do you say that I am? This question that Jesus asked is echoed throughout history. It's a question that confronts every single one of us, just like it confronted me on that island in Oregon in 2007. We don't get to hide behind others' opinions. We all must answer this for ourselves. So Peter chimes in. It's always Peter. Peter says, you are the Messiah. After following Jesus for about a year, seeing Jesus teach and heal and befriend sinners, Peter gets it right. He says, the Messiah has finally arrived, and you, Jesus, are it. In Matthew's gospel, which records this same conversation happening, Jesus praises Peter for this. He said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. He says, Peter, you got it right. See, up until now, a few demons have declared Jesus' identity, but not one person has truly identified Jesus for who he was until now, and it's Peter. This is sort of a high point for Peter. And then in verse 30, we read this. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And that's kind of a strange thing, right? Why would this have, have this high point? You get it right, and then Jesus is like, keep it quiet. Uh, have you ever seen those uh, the memes floating around the internet where it's like what society thinks I do and then like what I actually do as like the public perception? Uh, I want to show you a couple, a couple examples here. So uh, we've got an accountant, like society just thinks like right, like th bathing in money, like right? having a money party all the time. My wife is an accountant. She says, here's what I actually do. I just try to get receipts from people all day long. Like just give me your receipts, okay? This is what like she wakes up in the night asking for receipts. Uh, how about the next one? Uh, teacher, right? We have this sort of idyllic society, uh, vision in our mind a society of a teacher who's up front and they're like dutifully instructing and the kids are attentive and they're you know doing great teachers smiling and what in reality it's like Sunday night 10 p.m. and you're trying to stay awake while just grading those papers right uh, how about this one a doctor doctors like their characteristic in the scrubs and they're like focused and they're analytical and they're like well what are they looking at and as it turns out uh, they're looking just at WebMD like the rest of us <laughs> This actually happened to me. I went in, I was like, I don't know what's wrong with me. And my doctor sat and they said, hmm. uh, and then she turned around her computer and she opened up WebMD and started scrolling. I'm like, you can't even pretend like, you know, like turn the computer the other way. And it's like, say, this is what my 12 years of medical experience has gotten me. That's a soapbox, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> So, so what about the Messiah? So when people thought of Messiah, what came to mind? The word Messiah means anointed one, anointed one. God's people, if you know the story of the Old Testament, lots of ups and downs, right? It was not up and to the right. Uh, throughout their history, they had lots of enemies who waged war on them, who would occupy their land. Uh, at one point, they were exiled from their own land. And Old Testament prophets predicted a day when there would arise from amongst God's people a figure called the Messiah who would come and liberate God's people once and for all so that there wouldn't be any more of this enemy nonsense. And by the time of Jesus, the Jews were under the thumb of the Romans, Roman occupation. And so it was widely assumed that if the Messiah came here in the first century, that he would come with a sword in his hand for the Romans. So when people thought Messiah, this is what they pictured in their minds, society's view. 
So you can see why Jesus would want to keep it on the DL that he's the Messiah, right? Uh, Rome squashed anything that even had the faintest whiff of social unrest. And so if word spread that there was this Jewish man who claimed to be God's anointed liberator, and he was gaining quite a following, you can imagine uh, what Rome would do, right? And so when Jesus says, don't let other people know that I'm the Messiah, Peter is probably standing there thinking, right, of course, we need some more time. We need some time to get some more followers, to rally the troops, maybe get some weapons and a battle plan. So people think this is what the Messiah does. Jesus comes in with sort of a right hook. Verse 31, he says, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. So if this is society's vision of the Messiah coming in with a sword, Jesus paints a different picture. He says, this is actually what I've come to do. I'm sure Peter is just hearing this and he's thinking, hold on. What? Like, this is not what I expected. This is, this is wrong. Hey, you know, Jesus, yeah, you've gotten maybe on the wrong side of some religious authorities, but you are the anointed one. You're, the Messiah. You're more powerful than they are. And, and so here's Jesus saying this, and he's thinking, surely Jesus is just talking crazy. Maybe he's misunderstood what it means to be the Messiah and just needs a gentle correction, right? And maybe, maybe just some coaching. He's got a case of negative self-talk, and so he's like going to rub Jesus' shoulders and shove him back out in the ring to do his Messiah thing. This is what Peter does, right? So Peter then, Mark says, takes Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. In Matthew's gospel, Peter says, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Fleming Rutledge once wrote, the world's religions have common traits. But until the gospel of Jesus Christ burst on the Mediterranean world, no one in the history of human imagination had conceived of such a thing as a crucified worship of a crucified man. And Peter, he can't conceive of it either, even though he's a Jew, even though he's an insider disciple of Jesus. And so instead of considering the possibility that maybe something in him needs adjustment, he steps forward and says, Jesus, you are the one who needs adjustment. So how does gentle Jesus, meek and mild, respond? Verse 33. <clears throat> But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Which I confirmed is an actual bumper sticker you can buy. Okay, I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying it's out there. You did not hear it from me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus has stern words for Peter. He tells Peter that his perspective is limited and shallow, that he's focusing merely on human concerns, that he's tried to distract Jesus from what he has come to do as the Messiah. And that's exactly the kind of thing that Satan tries to do. And as it turns out, Jesus tries to tell his disciples, hey, keep this under wraps that I'm the Messiah, not because I need more time to get my battle plan together, but rather you need more time to relearn everything you thought you knew about how God should act. Peter had rightly proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah. He had the right word, but the wrong definition. Scholars tell us that Inigo Montoya was actually there that day, and he looked at Peter and he said, you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. It's actually happened, you check. Peter, that's a niche joke right there. Peter had the right word, but the wrong definition. See, Jesus would do battle. But it would be not against the Romans, it would be against the enemies of Satan, sin, and death. Jesus would win his victory through bloodshed, but his, the blood would be his own, and it would be at the cross. Jesus would liberate his people from bondage, but it would be much more than economic and political freedom. It would be liberation from spiritual bondage to sin, a liberation to eternal life, and reconciliation with the God of the universe. Amen. But all this meant that Peter, the man Peter had come to recognize as the Messiah, would have to suffer, be rejected, and die. And this goes against everything Peter expected. He hears about Jesus' definition of the Messiah, and he thinks, that's not the kind of Lord I want. 
This is the temptation that every single one of us faces, in my experience as a pastor. For 2,000 years, people have been intrigued and inspired by Jesus. That's undeniable, right? We recognize there's something special about this man. But every once in a while, Jesus will say something or do something that will make us uncomfortable. And when that happens, our tendency is to try to sand off the rough edges of Jesus, to try to refine him and redefine him to suit our tastes. In the words of Mr. Tumnus of Narnia, we try to tame the wild lion that is Jesus. In his heart of hearts, Peter, he wants a customizable Christ. And the same is true of us. This is why 43% of American evangelicals, professing Christians, can agree with the statement that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. It's because we have bought into this idea that religious truth is relative truth. And the result is that we have this malleable Messiah, right? Like a Mr. Potato Head Jesus, where we encounter something that we don't like and we feel full permission to just remove that piece and pop in something that is more to our style. Here's the problem. Jesus refuses to be customized. And when he tries, Jesus doesn't miss a beat, right? He fires back a rebuke at Peter. So this raises an important question for us. Jesus loves Peter, yes? Yes, he does. But that does not stop Jesus from rebuking Peter when he's off base. Jesus loves you, yes? Yes, he does. More than you can imagine. But here's the question. Does the Jesus you worship have the right to rebuke you? Does he have the ability to rebuke you? Because here's the reality. If Jesus never disagrees with you, it's probably not Jesus you're worshiping. It's probably not Jesus you're believing in, but yourself. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What our culture values and religious experiences these days is what you might call affirmation without transformation. What many of us hope for is a Jesus who is not so much a king to follow, but rather kind of a cosmic cheerleader who really doesn't leave the sidelines uh, and certainly does not confront us when we're off base. So today, when was the last time Jesus disagreed with you? And when was the last time that disagreement produced a change in you? You might ask it this way. When you encounter Jesus, who walks away changed? Is it you or is it him? Jesus says this, but what about you? Who do you say I am? What do you put in that blank? What do you put in that blank? All of us have to answer that question somehow. Who is Jesus to you? Who do you say he is? Jesus finishes with this. Verse 34. Jesus called the crowds to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Friends, in a world that says you got to look out for number one, cling as tightly as you can to your life, because if you don't, you might lose it. Jesus comes along and he offers this paradox, this promise. He says, if you want to save your life, lose it for me. There's a reason uh, here at the bridge we often use this posture of open hands, right? We believe that we are most prone to cling to uh, things in our life that don't actually produce what we are looking for. They're just going to be disappointed. And, and we also know that it's very hard for God to put a gift into the hands of somebody who has clenched fists. And so we enter the space each week with this posture. We, we want to say with our body what we desire to say with our heart and mind, that God, we are here open-handed before you. We want to let go of what you want us to let go of, and we want to receive what you have for us. What do you have for us? So what does it look like to lose our life for the sake of Christ? Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. This is the sort of one-sentence job description for the disciple of Jesus. And by the way, if you want to know what Jesus has to say about the prosperity gospel, you need to look no further than this verse. 
in a world where the three-part sort of conventional wisdom is you got to find yourself, avoid suffering, and blaze your own trail, Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. This is the fine print that Jesus puts right on the front page. He says, hey, before you desire to be my disciple, here are the terms and conditions. Here's what you've got to know. Just as you don't get to define who I am, you also don't get to define what it means to follow me. And admittedly, there's something like shocking about that, right? And we look at that and we're like, Pff, I don't hear people usually talk about Jesus that way. And here Jesus is saying it about himself, right? But, but you look at this, it's actually like d- deeply refreshing to hear Jesus speak this frankly, right? Like have you ever been to um, a restaurant that doesn't allow for substitutions or modifications, right? You ever, it's, it's like, it's a weird experience. If you haven't had this happen to you, it's typically like fancier places, you sit down and the waitress comes and, and you say, yeah, I'll get the special, uh, but I'll do it without the coconut sauce. Uh, and she looks at you and says, uh, no. And you, and you think, I promise, if this happens to you, your first thought will be, uh, this is America. Like, you, that's really your impulse. Like, I will do what I want. Give me the thing without the coconut sauce. And, and you, like, get in this argument, and, and then you say, why can't I have it? And, and the response is always this. Uh, the chef specifically designed that flavor combination, and it's perfect. Don't touch it. And so you submit, right? And then you enjoy this dish, and for the very first time in your whole life, you actually enjoy coconut sauce. Why, why do restaurants like that exist? Because a good chef knows what he's doing. Yeah. He says, don't touch a good thing. Yeah. The same is true with Jesus. He says, I am who I am, right? And this is what it looks like to be my disciple. No substitutions, no modifications. You can take it or leave, leave it. It will not be easy. But if you trust in me, if you follow me, your life will never be the same. Yeah. And you'll never regret it. So Jesus says there's this threefold part to discipleship. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Just a brief word on each. It says deny yourself. Our impulse is usually the opposite. This is where we get off base from the very start. What we tend to do is we start with our vision of the good life. We reverse engineer a Jesus who will be useful to our purposes. We make him the mascot, and then we call that discipleship. This is Peter's temptation. This is the reason he was rebuked. This is why letting Jesus define himself is so important. Jesus says, start with me. Let your entire lives be shaped by me. This is, by the way, what we proclaim in baptism. If you were here a couple weeks ago, we go down into the waters, we say, the old me is dead and gone. When I raise out of the waters, I'm a new creation, and Jesus gets to call the shots. Baptism, our walk with Jesus, begins with a public proclamation of self Denial. Second, Jesus says, take up your cross. This means we have to let go of a lot of other things. If we're going to take up a cross, we will have to let go of other things. Just as Jesus' cross came with suffering and rejection, so does ours. Taking up our cross means being willing to endure whatever hurts, pain, discomfort comes from gospel obedience. When we deny ourselves the pursuits, the pleasures of this world, it will often come at the cost of loneliness, of criticism, isolation from people who once cheered us on in our old life. It might cost you friends. It might cost you a sin that has been a fixture in your life for a long time. It might even make you a few enemies. To commit to following Jesus is to come to terms with the fact that when you begin to follow him, you will have a thousand unlived lives. We let go of those things. Third, Jesus says, follow me. This is to live a life with a direction towards Jesus, with a momentum of what we call around here becoming like Jesus for the sake of the world. This is to go wherever he calls. This is to follow him into situations, even if they're uncomfortable and unfamiliar, this is to live on mission for the sake of the world. It's to believe that it really is better to give than to receive. It is to live a life that loves our neighbors as ourself. In short, to be a disciple is to do the kinds of things that Jesus did. It's that simple. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, uh, that's fine, but what you just described sounds quite difficult. It sounds hard. Isn't Jesus about grace? This sounds like a lot of work. Here's how I would respond. Being forgiven by Jesus is free. Following Jesus will cost you everything. 
forgiveness from Jesus is free. Following Jesus will cost you everything. You and I are forgiven because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Nothing, nothing can add to that or take away from that. It is a free gift of grace. But this grace, listen, is not a license to go live however we want. To abuse forgiveness in this way, to go on living however we please, is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. Cheap grace. But we we are adopted into the family of God by grace, unmerited favor, because of what Jesus did. But then comes the project of learning how to live in the family of God. It takes a lifetime. And that learning is what Bonhoeffer calls costly grace. And it is costly. It is. But what's the alternative? Look how Jesus finishes this. He says, what good is it if you gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? Friend, what good is it if you make varsity and forfeit your soul? What good is it if you get the full ride scholarship and yet forfeit your soul? What good is it if you hit a million followers? What good is it if you get the promotion, you make partner, you retire at 50 and yet forfeit your soul? If Jesus were to show up in middle Tennessee, he'd probably say something like, what good is it if you get the 10 acre homestead and the goats and the chickens and you forfeit your soul? So so, so what what is it that you're clinging to today? What are you striving towards? Even if you get that thing, maybe this is a good time to stop and reflect and say, even if I get that thing and I lose my soul, will it have been worth it? Maybe for you today, it's time to let go, to let go, to begin to contemplate. Maybe it's time to follow Jesus, to count the cost and say yes. And when you say yes, it will be costly. But here is his promise to you. He says, in following me, you will come alive like never before. In following me, the journey might be difficult, but it will always be good. And in following me, I'll never leave your side. I'll be with you every step of the way. So where do you find yourself today? Maybe you have been following, but maybe sort of half-heartedly. I think this is probably a lot of us. Maybe there's been very little room for Jesus to correct rebuke, change our path, and it's time to let him come all the way in. Maybe you've been following Jesus faithfully for a long time. Maybe your life looks patterned after Jesus. I say, praise God, we have a lot of you in this church who fall into that category. Maybe your next step is to look out for 17-year-old Corey in your midst, to be willing to walk alongside of that person in grace and to be willing to have the hard conversation to say, What do you make of Jesus? Because you can't stay neutral forever. Or maybe you find yourself drawn to Jesus, but you feel hesitant to come because you think your life is just too messy. Like you have too many unanswered questions to begin following him. And if that's you, I just wanna finish by drawing your attention to one final thing in our passage. There are three little words at the very beginning that are very easy to skip over, but they might unlock something for you today. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? When does Jesus begin this invitation to discipleship? It's not the end of the story. It's not when all the facts are in and all doubts have been fully eradicated. He asked them in chapter eight of a 16 chapter story. He asks them right in the middle. He asks them on the way. And so maybe you feel like you're on the way today, like you still have doubts and questions to be worked out. Let's say Jesus is still for you today. He still asks you right where you are, who do you say I am? And and if you are ready today to begin that journey to say, Jesus, you are king. I wanna begin following you. I know the cost and I say yes to you. Say, don't leave today without telling someone Come get prayer up front. We've got a a webpage actually that's specifically for new believers because we see so many people take this step every year. Bridge.tv slash new believer, go there and we'll lay out some next steps for you so that we can walk alongside you and cheer you on as your new church family. Jesus asks Peter the question, who do you say that I am? But once we, like Peter, confess that Jesus is the Messiah, 
we then turn the question back to Jesus. Say, Jesus, you are the Messiah. I've answered your question. Who do you say I am? And so now it's my turn. We then turn to Jesus and we say, Jesus, who do you say I am? And then you let his response to you shape everything you do. And you won't regret it. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at BridgeChurchTN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.